the other key piece uh, that that uh, became evident, I think, both in Ukraine and even to some extent in the India-Pakistan standoff, I think similarly in the Israel-Middle East context, is the role of geospatial imaging, geo-intelligence, right, which was traditionally considered the domain of the governments. But much like has been the theme of our conversation, it's the commercial players that have uh, leapt ahead, right? Uh, players like Planet Labs, Maxar. Today, you know, it's not uncommon to see Maxar images being flashed on television to prove the damage that one country was actually able to uh, conduct on the other. When the U.S. strikes uh, Iran recently, you want to show images of what happened, right? So talk to us about how that's panning out. Like how how um, how has that geospatial intelligence piece evolved, right? Um, What's the relationship again now between uh, the governments and these geospatial providers, right? Um, and uh, what's 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 to be expected there? Like, are, are, are we expecting a greater amount of evolution of that uh, technology also? Or are we at some kind of peak there? Or are we not yet? The geospatial piece has been key since the beginning of the space age. Uh, yeah. I teach at uh, George Washington Space Policy Institute. The founder of it, uh, John Loxton, uh, sometimes says the space age began the, daily, the day after the Pearl Harbor attacks. Because this idea, there was strategic surprise. Uh, and yeah. if we had only had assets, space assets, or some way to know that an what attack was, was imminent, yeah. we could have prevented it. So, you know, we had the U-2 and some of the airborne assets and then we went up to space. So this idea of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance from space is what governments look to. And that's why it was so secretive for decades and decades until even just in the last few years. So it was just it was part of the intelligence. It was part of a considered a national asset and uh, what you had these these exquisite Earth observation uh, capabilities. What you've seen recently is more open source reporting, more public. You've seen, like you mentioned, Maxar. I remember looking at the pictures of the Russian tanks all lined up on a road prior to yeah. going in. It's like, what are you guys doing? Uh, so th this idea, so we're able to talk about it. Those images, that same image 20 years ago would have been classified. You would never have seen it. So because the resolution, what you're seeing is improvements in resolution, probably in uh, in post-production, the analysis and the analytics, the way that software can actually improve the image is the greatest improvement. Physics is physics, and aperture is an aperture. So yeah. I can't really change the laws of physics, so an optical sensor is going to have limitations based on the size of its lens. But when we look to synthetic aperture radar, some of the uh, radio frequency, geolocation capabilities, multispectral, uh, using different wavelengths. I think we're going to see that. So we should expect all weather persistent coverage, I think, is the trend. A lot of those moving to commercial and a lot of those becoming publicly available. So what, you know, will Planet or a Planet-like company sell its imagery, imagery to anybody at any time for any intent that they want to track ships, troop movements, uh, tank positions, and the like. So that's the question. I would say we need to plan for that potential future, how we're going to protect that technology from getting out there as best we can, or at least to stay ahead of it. 